So I have the delight to roast Lee Shruben. Uh, yes. So uh, Lee got his uh, BS in uh, operations research uh, here in 68. Uh, the, the initials BS are quite appropriate if you know Lee. Uh, that's, well, yeah. Um, he then uh, actually had a couple of interesting stints. Part of it was in the Navy, and then he got his master's from UNC, 73, PhD, 75 in Yale. Then he joined the uh, faculty somewhere else. And realized the error of his ways, missed the snow, so came back and he was here for, for a very long time, until like 99 I think, at which point he said, yeah, sun is nice. So he moved to Berkeley and he's been there uh, since as a chancellor and professor. Mm -hmm. So uh, Lee has done a lot of stuff in simulation and he's, he's famous within the simulation community for a few really big ideas. One was uh, standardized time series. There, I threw in one nice thing, right? Thank you. One nice thing, that's enough. I so, speak next. <laughs> he speaks next, so oh, I, would, I told him I would be nice. Uh, so yeah, uh, Lee, take it away. Oh, thank you. I, I should apologize uh, to Henderson because uh, when I left here, he replaced me. And we have this huge simulation class some of you were in. It's up to 200, 200 students. It's like, it's like lecturing to a photograph of a classroom. <laughs> and uh, I did not tell Henderson about that particular job. So we had this huge simulation class. I'm always a little nervous when I see students who have in that class because near, I was here 25 years exactly, and to the day, because I retired, <coughs> still on the faculty as a retiree uh, after 25 years. And so I got married shortly before that. And things changed. I grew up. My wife told me that you don't have to say everything you think. <laughs> that was necessary. Uh, and so, but I saw this 50-year anniversary, and, and I know you do math, but I do arithmetic. And I came out that I came here in operations research exactly 50 years ago, uh, 1966, for those that do math and not arithmetic. And so. It saved my life. Operations uh, saved my life because during that period of time, there was a conflict in Vietnam, and all of the people my age were being drafted, and I was uh, uh, being drafted. We got drafted out of college. And uh, Byron Saunders said, operations research is now a major, and the Navy knows what operations research is. Put that down, put down operations research that, sure, we need that. So I got myself two more years, and then I got to go in the Navy as an operation researcher. So they knew what that was. That advice, the OR part, turned out to be, yeah, I couldn't probably not have finished college without it. So we've been together 50 years. I want to talk about the next 50 years uh, a little bit, mostly. This slide is not one of mine. Uh, I'm one of those people. <laughs> Jack Mustad is the good looking one. Who put that There could be slides that I don't know about. Uh, okay, so the 50 years. I'll try to get through this fairly quickly. Henderson told you most of the high point. But I am from Kansas, and uh, I was larger then, uh, a lot larger, and I played football because the way you get out of Kansas, you get a football scholarship. Uh, and so a fellow from Dartmouth came out to Kansas, and I remember the Green Sox, and he said, we always win the Ivy League. And I'm not sure I'd heard of the Ivy League, it's kind of a shirt style at the time. Uh, and I asked, who always loses? He said, Brown, Columbia, and Cornell. I said, I wrote to Brown, Columbia, and Cornell, and said, I'm an all-state football player, I get good SATs, and Cornell said, okay, you can come here. So I came here, to play football. It was a very short career. I played Princeton and I got injured. And back then, everybody got football scholarships, there's no limit. So I could have gone to lots of places where they really played football. I didn't like the contact part, <laughs> you know, the hitting part. Uh, and so I came here because it had a very good education and a really bad football team. So I figured that'd be okay. I got injured. And back then, when you get injured, you lose your scholarship. So I went to coach, I said, you know, coach, I can hand out jock straps, I can do things, I can, you know, just let me finish the year and I'll go back to Kansas. 
And he said, Shruben, you have an engineering scholarship. You do not have a football scholarship. So immediately, never went back, and uh, I was tricked into thinking I was here to play football. <laughs> The, Max mentioned that there was a four-year Bachelor of Science degree. I started out when it was a five-year Bachelor of Science degree. But Max, thank you, converted this and you could get a four-year degree. And the draft board said I could allow four years to get a degree. So I switched to this. Byron Saunders said you should have operations research in your resume. That would save you from being shot at. Uh, and indeed it did. Um, then I was also a co-op student. So, after my freshman year, I went to be a co-op with electric. Everybody was an engineer back then, but I thought I was an electric engineer. I worked in Emerson Electric's R&D lab. And we did a number of things like design a switch for a closed dryer motor to see when it could use less electricity. And one job I was asked is to develop a sensor that could tell big motors from little motors very fast. So I went out there and I didn't know what this was for. And I finally asked the person who asked me the dump, says, well, what's it for? And he took me out and he showed me this, it's like a train set. It was a factory with automation in it. I said, wow, you got the whole train set. I've got my little sensor down here. That's what I'm doing. What are you doing? He said, I'm a industrial engineer. I never heard that term. Industrial engineer. Hmm. Find out what it is. That time with Byron Saunders saying, you know, you need a deferment, ORIE, best of all worlds, and uh, join that major in 1966, which is um, 50 years ago. Uh, the, um, and I finished up my co-op with Emerson. I also got married after my sophomore year. There was a marriage deferment. I mean, there's lots of things you could do. Uh, I graduated in 68. There was a good job market for co-op students. And that's something to think about. Uh, right now, the, the things that students have a difficult time is they want experience. If you're a co-op student, you have a year and a half experience because you take these semesters as a co-op, et cetera. And so I think that's a very good program. Uh, I'd like to see it expanded in some way that, that uh, students do graduate with some experience. Had lots of good job offers. I had one I could not refuse. It was the uh, US Navy. And I got this uh, order to report for induction. And so I uh, got to do that. And then a while later, returned back to, uh, to Cornell. And this six years, three kids later, uh, I worked at Emerson Electric for a while, and uh, then the Navy. And that was quite interesting because we were working on nuclear missile targeting. And, and we used game theory to kind of get, make sure we had an equilibrium. Because if somebody didn't have this, there would be a first strike. It was called MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction, to make sure that anybody that even pushed the button or look, looked at the button sideways, the world would destroy itself. And that was, that was kind of depressing. Uh, I went for Operations Research Incorporated after the Navy. That's the real name of it, and they, they got the name. Uh, and went to the University of North Carolina because ORI sent me, I needed to get some initials after my name so I could run a project. I didn't have an advanced degree. And they said, you go anywhere you want. UNC was going to win the NCAA basketball. I'm a basketball fan. You look at me, OK, short legs, nearsighted, white. I can't play basketball. And so, but I'm a big fan. So I went to UNC. They came in third. Ah, couldn't stand it, transferred to Yale. Uh, <laughs> after, it was a tough, tough year in basketball. <laughs> Went to Yale, and uh, there I studied lots of things, three different majors, three different colleges, three different advisors. Uh, my advisor, a couple years in a row, quit the year after they were my advisor. <laughs> I thought about maybe hiring myself out to destroy departments. I could just come there, be my advisor for a year, and move on. And I went to the University of Florida Medical School uh, because it was nearest the equator. I had a very clear objective function, minimize absolute latitude. I wanted to be warm. And I went there, I was there one year. And then Andy Schultz, bless his heart, called me up and said, I hear you're getting fired. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> it turns out that Florida had violated some laws and that, I, uh, that all the uh, 
junior faculty, all the faculty unionized them. They formed a union. And they formed a union, and the legislature responded by saying anybody with under three years is, is not, doesn't have seniority in the union. So they fired us. So all the faculty under three years were fired, which included, I think, most of their women minorities. So they had to back off that. But by the time they backed off, two weeks later, I accepted a job at Cornell. And, and they lost a lot of junior faculty there. Moved here, uh, and the first job I had was being <coughs> Andy Schultz's teaching assistant. Now, I thought I was going to be a professor. They said, no, he's a TA. And so I, I literally, I graded the papers, I ran the recitations, I was his teaching assistant, and I didn't realize I was inheriting his course, which is this 431, uh, 410 course, which everyone had to take. It's a required course. Also inherited a simulation course, which everybody had to take. I think I only taught required course. I volunteered for lots of other courses. I wanted to not teach. Um, and then just did the old thing here. Uh, and in 2001, I retired from ORIE at CU and went to IUR at C. <laughs> Slightly dyslexic, so it doesn't matter to me. Uh, except when I refer to them as ORIE, it's still annoying. Uh, you know, it's, it gets caught in your mind. So we moved on to there, uh, and there's today's birthday party. I decided that uh, since I'm speaking right after lunch, I should have some interesting pictures. This is my high school football team. Uh, that's not me. Uh, not politically correct. They're called the, high, the Manhattan High School Indians. However, when I Googled Manhattan football and Lee Shriven, which is an unusual name, I got the same pictures. <laughs> so we'll have to stick to words. No kidding. There it was. And uh, so I'll, I'll try to entertain you with, I guess, pictures. When I was here, it was very unusual. Ha about half the faculty were not tenured. Uh, and so there's a large, I think maybe a majority of untenured faculty. There were, you know, there's a Sander and Turnbull and Bixby and Trotter and Todd and uh, uh, Heath and Rod Taku. Very famous, and one other guy. Me. Me. Yeah. It, there was a bunch of untenured faculty. And so I think that was a wonderful experience to be there with a lot of other junior faculty who were interested in doing research in different areas as I was. And uh, we worked pretty well together. I taught a simulation class. Uh, I think nobody else likes to teach simulation. Sorry, sorry Shane. It's, it's not a course that's that popular to teach. It's, it's okay. Then I started doing simulation research because I did not know the answers to any of the questions the students were asking. Um, so I decided to try to figure some of these out. Some of them, I see some of the students in here that figured them out for me. Uh, I taught online. They, they offered a Cornell online course. This is a, so we're going to teach online. We're going to have Cornell University online. And I volunteered to do it. Uh, so I was the very first group that taught this online course. Turned out they paid us money for registration. They, you know, I don't know why they do this now, but they should because they got a lot of volunteers the next year. Uh, and anybody signed up for your course was online. Took a sabbatical to Purdue. My choices were Vienna, Austria, Palo Alto, West Lafayette. Uh, made that decision and returned. Um, I can't actually tell you why I returned, but my wife stayed there. Uh, I, I returned to save my marriage. Uh, and so I was a single dad for a while. In those years, if anybody was in the end, uh, I, I've changed. I don't park my motorcycle in the hallway anymore. Uh, some behavioral things. Took a sabbatic to make postgraduate school. I'm just sort of going to sabbatics now because in between I taught simulation. Uh, <laughs> and uh, then postgraduate school, that's a very nice stint if you can do that. And then I went to work at Semitech. This was a big change because Semitech uh, had this large, more money than they needed uh, to fund things, and they formed a center of research. And that center for research was here. Uh, well, we were renewed a couple times, so probably close to 10 years, uh, and supported a fair number of us doing things that we wanted to do. 
like heavy tail distributions uh, that was there. That's, I could make that somehow relevant. Uh, Maxwell retired and inherited the Schultz chair. It was that for maybe a couple of months. Um, and I retired and went to Berkeley. I miss Cornell every day. Thrilled to be back. I think that those who have, have left will feel the same way. Um, but I didn't have a lot of choice. I did come back after sabbatical. My wife told me that I was here for a while. She said, you know, Lee, I told it was your decision. You made the wrong one. <laughs> it's not your decision. <laughs> she uh, wanted warm weather. So we retired and, and, and went there. Uh, so now I'm teaching machine learning. So, you know, we decided we should brand our students so they can get good jobs. I had a graduate course in machine learning and enrollment uh, about across the university, about 70 people. And uh, they're working in bioproduction. <laughs> and there's a um, company that, uh, entrepreneurial in some sense, uh, this biogene company. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, a bit later. Accomplishment. I had the first desktop computer in this department. It was a uh, Heath kit all in one. Uh, got this kit, uh, put it together. Lou Valera, David Heath also got them. Had a speed. <laughs> Uh, you can see that things right now, we have this. Things have changed, it's kind of like Maxwell. We had a floppy disk, it was floppy, flopping around. And it had, uh, so this is like 10 million X in terms of uh, memory. You, you, can, you can do the algebra, uh, arithmetic. The things that I think are very important about Cornell is the richness of the environment. The chances, uh, the fact it's a real university uh, in sense of, well, Purdue was more of a technical school. I didn't know the difference on sabbatical there. But you do need these other colleges to work on things. And uh, so I had some work in, in manufacturing, mostly through Bill Maxwell, and, and working with semiconductor tools, applied materials, EMAT was there, uh, doing the usual kind of stuff. Food production, this came out through the Ag School. We worked on Cheerios, we worked on apples, we worked on milk. Uh, and a number of other things. Ah, quick question. Worked for General Mills in the Cheerios factory. They had this automatic factory that they'd set up in Rochester. Very interesting. You go through this Rochester, it's, it's kind of a dreary part of Rochester. No, I'm sorry. Uh, it was Buffalo. Dreary uh, part of Buffalo. You go through this, and there's this large five story building. I should warn you numbers are qualitative. They're big, little, and small. Maybe it was six stories, maybe four, but it was a building that was large for the area. It looked kind of dingy. When you walked in, it, it was absolutely really clean. And they made Cheerios there, made Wheaties there, and other things like this. They worried about a lot of things, such as getting a Wheatie wheat in a Cheerios box. And they're doing this thing, and they weren't getting the production out. They want to censor this. They didn't want to run out of Cheerios. Everybody loves Cheerios because as little babies, you're fed Cheerios. Because little babies can eat the Cheerios. You go, oh, taste for Cheerios. You run out of Cheerios, they try a different type of cereal. They don't want that ever to happen. So they didn't want to run out of Cheerios, and they're running dangerously close to Cheerios. They run this factory, came in, took a look at it, didn't have to do a simulation. I said, just slow it down. You're running it too fast. Um, it was automatic. They slowed it down. A couple weeks later, their production was up. Why did that work? Why did running it slower produce more? Okay, Because of the variability, there was a little jitter down in the box line. You see the very bottom of this factory, you see the, the box was jittering, and that would tend to slow things down, and this went all the way up to where they were uh, in, in their ovens, which would, they'd shoot a glob of Cheerio at a mesh to make little O's, which was flash fried, flash baked and hit the wall and down the Cheerios. And sometimes they were shutting the oven down just because the little jitter went all the way to the top. They slowed it down, the impact of the jitter was much less and they were able to get the smooth production out of that. So don't simulate, uh, they were gonna pay me to do a simulation study that I think it could have made the last two years. But it was just, you know, slow it down, that'll fix it. Yeah, good. Uh, Gerber baby food, things thing happened. Uh, disease management. This is something working primarily through the vet school. Uh, doing healthcare, animals mostly, um, pigs, and cows, and mad cows, insane cows. Uh, the, the vet school was very interesting to work with, and I think people in our department, the nice thing about ORI is 
we can't help anybody. We can do anything. And uh, the human, uh, I was working the last semester for the World Health Organization. And uh, this is when the Ebola was coming out and they wanted to do their uh, deployments, things like this. So we worked on that for a while. Uh, and that's about all I can say, except don't call it who. Call it WHO. They've heard the jokes about who. Um, communications networking, project management, working on construction, fire trucks, uh, entertainment and recreation. Worked with uh, Bob Lamb, who's chair, got Robin Rowney and I consulting gig with a company that does TV spot markets. And there was this <laughs> auction where they would sell the local channel to every, every now and they have to say this is, you know, some channel in some area. They have that 30 seconds for the local spot market and we could fill the spot market in. Uh, and that auction is working there. Um, golf, worked with the hotel school, Sherry Kimes, who was acting dean for a while, who has a degree in operations research. Uh, so if you don't know Sherry, you should get to know her. Uh, we worked on golf courses. And golf, huge industry. Once again, could have done a simulation for big money, but I said, why don't we just name the holes instead of number them? How's that going to work? Why did that work? And it did. It got about 10% more throughput when they named the holes after flowers or Greek gods. Or something. Not one, two, three, four, nine, you know, through the 18th hole. Don't name them. Don't number them. Name them. Start anywhere. That's right. Well, we removed the constraint. You move the constraint, it's going to do better. And so they would have these little news, these little things that would tell you, play the next hole, play lilac next, and then lily. And they could do this and move around and, and get around the slope people. And so just uh, things like variability cause congestion and remove a constraint, pretty straightforward things for people in this room. Unusual. Science and religion, yes. Had a student from genetics who did a, her project, and she's now a professor at Yale. And her project in this course, this graduate course, was to see if a three sex species could compete and dominate two sex and one sex species. So on the earth we have one sex species and two sex species. We don't have any three sex species. The dominant theory uh, at the time was the genetic mixing would allow us enough variety to where we'd survive. So she did her simulation of the three sex species competing and all sorts of events would happen. But the three sex species never made it. And that caused a lot of consternation that people <coughs> thought of, you know, in that area. But also there's some religious connotations here about evolution, that theory of, of mixing. We tried to encapsulate, she tried to encapsulate, it became part of her thesis um, in encapsulating how a genetic mixing would work according to the theory. Did it. Uh, education, these are things that happened here. Herbs, event graphs, put that in. Uh, that's something that uh, is an end joke in simulation. Uh, started to use a software named Sigma, which is still around. It was started before Windows. And so it was run on a PC without Windows, under DOS. It needed a mouse. They didn't have mice. So I found some mice and put them on reserve in the library for my course because it's kind of hard to do graphics when you can't point at something. You have to use the arrow keys and the enter. And so the mouse is a big breakthrough. It had the mouse, had it on reserve here. Uh, the library, and it turns out that these graphs can be turned into mixed integer programs that have duals, and the dual, you know, it's got a GG1Q, it's dual is a lot sizing problem. Just sort of knowing that relationship between a, two problems whose first name is the, the single server Q and the lot sizing problem, that they have an explicit duality relationship that comes from math programming. So all those kinds of just being, I like to say broadly educated, possibly being uneducated was my advantage. Uh, another thing that was unusual, my TAs won the Outstanding TA Award almost every year um, here and then at, at, at Berkeley every year except the first one, my TA is the Outstanding TA. Different courses, different TAs, what's the commonality for this? And I think it's good mentoring, but it turns out it's good cop, bad cop. <laughs> <laughs> they save my students from me. Uh, and I taught most of the required courses here, just one of those things that happened. Uh, a couple of innovations, and this, this leads into what I think the next part of this, which is to think about the future of our field a little bit. 
And uh, one of the things that I think I could share with the professors here is giving quizzes. We got a problem. In class quizzes, students don't like it. And attendance, you want to make sure they show up. I have almost perfect attendance because I give advanced placement. It's a quiz, but I call it advanced placement because they get to add their scores to their next exam. So they can go in with 40 AP credits, flunk the exam, and get an A. Um, that was one innovation. I also had the million point exam. I was kind of annoyed by students always asking for credit. I said, okay, yeah, okay, another thousand points, 10,000 points, and they'd be happy about halfway down the hallway. And they realized, no, no, it's a million point exam. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, So, but it turned out the AP credit, you get perfect attendance, and you can also find, another thing is I changed two words in my term projects to term products. And that is they have to think now about something they're going to do that has generic value to a market that solve a generic kind of problem and they're uh, uh, rather than just doing the coffee shop down the corner. I'm so tired of people modeling the coffee shop and gas stations. Uh, but these term products turned out to be pretty good and they have turned into companies twice just from the products. Uh, so let's uh, get back here. I clicked way too many things. But let's go here. Uh, I was going to call it our next 50 years, but you know, I just turned 70, so I think it'll be your next 50 years. Um, and one of the thoughts, I, I've got a student who's been working on the Google self-driving car project from day zero. And we've kind of kept in touch with this. He rides one of these cars to work. Gets in it, goes to work. <laughs> the question they were asked uh, at Google was, if the internet, as it envisions five, ten years out, and it's kind of hard to envision over the last five years what's been happening, but the connectivity will continue to grow at the pace it's going. What if that was invented before the car? What would the car look like? I would argue it wouldn't have four wheels look like a wagon, but that's what the car looks like. It's invented after the internet. So the challenge we have is, I think, what if it was invented before this department was founded? Right now, we're, we're at a meeting to found this department. We all have common interests, and we're going to find a department. And but there's this internet where we're totally connected. Uh, the the project with WHO was uh, uh, done almost entirely through the internet, through meetings and conferences from all over the world, um, and we met face to face a couple times. But they came out to see me. And also uh, education. Uh, my term reports, they used to be written reports, they're now YouTube videos. And so if you were to Google IOR 131, that's the course, simulation, uh, Berkeley, you would find a whole lot of videos. These are the term products. And the product has its little, what's the market for this product? What's the model? You know, the usual kind of thing. They're selling themselves. And these videos have been used, they put them on their readers, their resumes, and they get jobs. The student says, yeah, I got a job from my term product video. And so the video is to sell the students, and I think that's made my life a lot easier. Um, prerequisites. This machine learning course that I volunteered to teach, after reading a lot of books, finding out what it was, thank goodness it's based in statistics, I did study that. Uh, and but there are a lot of prerequisites you have to know about what Markov chains are. You have to kind of know graph theory, at least the, what it took me is. There's some things you need to know, lots of prerequisites, and the course didn't have any prerequisites. And I didn't want to teach it at a really shallow level because I wanted to learn it. Uh, and so all the prerequisites became links to the web. And I had, you know, read, uh, watch this particular lecture in this particular Coursera, not the rest of it, just this thing. It's a fair amount of work, but you can find really good videos on Markov chains uh, and really good videos on probability and statistics. And then there were one particular um, topic, uh, probability statistics, someone didn't have any of this. And so there's this great courses. It's a high production value but for profit company that sells, uh, how many people have heard of great courses? I have lots of them. We could share those because my wife found out that. Uh, and I watched the statistics one, the probability one of these, <coughs> did a good job. So all the prerequisites were online, they were links. I said, here's your prerequisites, take those. And now we're in the last couple weeks of this class, 
And some of the students have what I would hope would be prerequisites, some don't, I'm kind of keeping track, and I can't tell the difference now from their performance and stuff like that. So what it's going to say is perhaps we'll have more time for the things that may be important to future engineers, which is collaboration, which is working together, which is uh, focusing on really in-depth things, not so much the prerequisite kind of material, which is very large. Um, Simulation, I see still talk senior year here in the for the website. Only required course for seniors. Reason being has lots of prerequisites. I move that to a junior course now by trying to get the prerequisite. Help students get jobs, and perhaps we can do that um, a little bit. And then we think about the structure. If there if there wasn't if there wasn't an ORE department, what if there wasn't a college of engineering? It wasn't a Cornell. What would it look like if we had to found it today? And I think it would look a bit different. For instance, colleges. When I was department chair out there, I did not, I would not major in my own field. There's too many restrictions. I had to take, like I did, thermodynamics, you had to take uh, uh, what they called statics, which is computing shear moments and something. And I thought those courses were pretty good, but I didn't learn able to get A's in them without learning that. Still don't know what entropy is other than the information part. But something in thermodynamics. Uh, so what about the colleges? It turned out that I could go to the Liberal Arts College at Berkeley, and they don't have a lot of constraints. So I proposed this major called Operations Research and Management Science. The science part, it's a science. So we now have, and it's been uh, there for about eight years, it's a, it's a larger major than the engineering major, you have 100 students on the waiting list and they're restricted to people who are on the top part, of the, they can't apply unless they're in the top part of the class. They must transfer into it. It's usually popular and it's called Operating Research and Management Science. And part of the, the branding that goes on here about what, what do we call our students so they get a good job, it used to be data science, business analytics. This year, we're, I'm talking to placement people, so what, is, what, is, what are they looking for? And they're, they're looking for operations research. That was it. <laughs> we laughed. And that's what they told me. Yeah, okay, we can do that. <laughs> we'll figure out what that is. We'll rebrand ourselves to hit the market. It turns out that is uh, finally the major. So I think one of the things, uh, just finishing up, all the stuff I do is going to not be relevant necessarily because we do these huge experiments, um, data-driven models, um, we know what that is, models have to be correct, current, and credible, people have to believe what they are, and most of the simulation models you see in the world, they were built, it takes about six months to build a model of what the system was six months ago, and to be current is, is a little bit harder. So what is happening now is they're embedding a simulation model into their information systems. And I'm working right now with the UC uh, uh, San Diego, UC San Diego, they're hoping a new hospital. They're embedding a simulation model into their information system. Works a bit like this. You come into ER, your EMR, a medical record, has a doctor ordering a sonogram, a sonograph, and then you've got a sonographer and a sonograph, they come in, so that piece of equipment has an RFD tag, you see there's a patient, there's somebody there, they, they're doing it, and then it reports in the medical record. So you've got three things telling you that there was an activity going on, which is to do that. And so when those activities, similar activities come out, there's just a lot of them, but the computer can kind of figure this out. But these activities are fairly common, and you get certain activities like somebody stole your sonograph because somebody walked off in the middle of part of the hospital. <coughs> But you get the activities that are strictly, strictly common in there. And what happens now is that rather than, if in the past, a hospital would say, well, we're going to have to re renovate this wing of the hospital. Renovating this wing, what's going to happen? How are we going to manage during the renovation period? What they'll do is have a simulation team come in, spend a lot of time building a model of this hospital as it was. Uh, you're never really current. And then run it with during the renovation to give them some ideas and insights out. Turns out that's way too late. The renovation's over by the time the simulation team's finished building the model. So have it embedded, and then when you have a question, you look at your information system and you look at 
what the future would be like when you change something. So you look at their, their data, it's data, it's always about the past, but operations research will tell you about the future, the alternative futures and the product of seeing different things. And so we have not just data driven models, but data created models. They're self generated. I'll show you a little bit how that works. Uh, and our example context is biopharmaceutical supply. And uh, the thing that got me interested in biopharmaceuticals was I, I was department chair when they started the Department of Bioengineering at Berkeley, and they needed an audience, so all department chairs had to come and, and go through the inauguration of the new department. And every slide said, we will save millions of lives. And then they show how they're doing it, and I can see that they perhaps killed one rat during this experiment they're talking about. To save millions of lives, they're going to have to be able to build, they're going to have to make millions of high quality, Doses, deliver them reliably, the right patient, the right time, the reasonable prices, and all those things that we can help them with. And so, and I claim to have invented the word bioproduction because I Googled it and it didn't exist. Spell checkers did not have to spell it, still don't. But the National Science Foundation is willing to give this high risk initiative grant. It's now a center out there uh, at Berkeley run by Phil Kaminsky uh, just to study with some industrial partners how that would work. Turned out we'd bitten off more than we, than we could shoot. It's, it's, it, it's semiconductors, I figured high-tech manufacturing, how hard could that be? Been working in semiconductors for about 10 years. Turned out it's kind of complicated. There's a factory in Berkeley, it's 34 acres. There's their production. They have 1,200 staff. And you see that little tray up there? That's how much they grub they can make in a year. That's not the real drug, incidentally. That's, that's powder. They don't dare put it out. This is a life saving drug, and it saves the lives of children. So, without this particular shot, uh, you've got to get it every two weeks. Uh, it's a factory protein for hemophilia. Uh, but you can save lives, and that's what it takes to make that. And I thought, huh, if we can use operations research to make another gram, that translates into more children's lives. And so when I used to work in semiconductor, I'd watch go around the factories and I could see in the cubicle art, they would have pictures of Hawaii or pictures of circuits. Uh, and I walk around the cube art here, and they have pictures of patients. And these are patients that are alive today because of what they're doing. You go to their annual meetings and they have, uh, say, a charge nurse in one of these hospitals give their keynote speech about how this particular pharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical is, uh, is helping these various children. So during this center, we had uh, guest speakers. And the best guest speaker intro I've ever seen was a fellow from Genentech comes up, he's ready to start his speech, his, his seminar, and a student raised his hand and said, before you start, I want to thank you for saving my life. I had cancer as a child, I took your drug, I'm here today for that. How is that for an opener? <laughs> wow. Well, I started mine by saying, oh, I saved my life. <laughs> it's a different context. Uh, so I was interested in this. Turns out there's a lot of uncertainty. You don't even know what they're making. It's a molecule. You can't characterize the molecule. They only know how it's made. So you made it a certain way, and it worked. If you make it exactly the same way again, you hope it works. And there's lots of things that uh, are involved in not, not working. So there's lots of uh, regulations going on. Um, Anything else? Big long changes. It took three years to approve a new freeze dryer for one of these factories. Freeze dryer of different size. So they have these long delays, production at risk. They have to somehow say, okay, this, this batch got some signs that it might not work. Do we continue with it or do we, 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 we jump it? These long delays, lots of variability and very dependent. It's not stationary, it's not the stuff that, that I was teaching in class. This is a little example of the long QA cycle. Some of these cycles are years. They freeze dry it, and they're not sure what's going to work or not. And so there's lots of regulatory requirements. You can pay lots of fines if you mess up. Process variability, this is a little chart about they made some changes, and you can see that they this might be a good change along here, or a bad change, because all it did was change the variability a little bit. Uh, but then you've got uh, another change that went through there. So, there's a lot of stuff happening. 
And um, you've got to make a pretty much good case for that. So how do you model this? And it turns out that I, I was a consultant for Genentech and Bayer at the time, trying to figure out how to do these. I couldn't really do it. And I had a, a graduate, two graduates at the time. They decided to form bio-g.com. So if you look at bio-g.com, you won't see me anywhere, but you'll see what they're doing. And what they're doing is they put together these little processes. And the thing to notice about this graph, if you look at simulations models, they have edges. The, the, the vertices are connected, and you have to have a modeler connect them. So you've got the process product flow or something connected into a graph. There are no edges. And what's happening here is the uh, system, we could draw edges in just for illustration. Those edges are totally, totally meaningless as far as the analysis goes. Model then, when you change things, it's hooked, hooked into their MS system, their manufacturing information system, and lots of other things. Uh, as you drill down, and you take a look at some of these activities, you'll see there's resources involved in those. A modeler would have to draw all those edges, or a team of modelers would have to draw every arrow in there, and then you drill down and see those, and you get four. This thing on, the, on your left there is a person. And that's what the activities this person does. And if I had to go in there as a modeling team, I would have to draw all of those arrows correctly. Uh, and they go both directions. Uh, there's certain, well, activities go both ways. To be able to do this, and the software that they're doing, it turns out not to draw any of the edges. The computer does it for you. It keeps it current. So that's, that's our uh, way of modeling things. We've moved that into uh, hospitals now. Uh, well, actually, I started out there trying to model the emergency room of Davis, uh, C. Davis Medical Department. They have nine ERs in there. It's a huge place, and a couple of virtual ERs. And they want to know, is it going to be a busy night? Should we call in some of our reserves? Or what would happen if we take one of these particular emergency rooms and, and renovate it? And so integrating the model into the information system turns out to be a very important thing. Rather than, oh, I need a model, then you build a model. Have it all ready to go. And there are uh, some folks working on taking data and trying to build optimization models that are solvable, uh, convex kind of optimization, optimization models, where the objectives and constraints are data generated. So I think we've got messy data, <coughs> certainly non-stationary dependency and those things. Examples, big factorial designs. Now this is an example of a little uh, uh, a switch in an aircraft. It has two settings, it's a, a dip switch, uh, 30, uh, 32 things. Factorial design took one minute per run. You can do the arithmetic. It's an 8,000 year experiment to find the best setting. We're gonna have to do something else. Uh, and the something else, I don't have an answer for. I only have the question, and that is, a question, and that is, what would this department look like if we were here now to start it? Uh, what would the college look like? Would it, I, I imagine it would be a lot different. How it's different, we may have lots of ideas on that. What would Cornell look like if the internet were here first? Um, and I, I, I do not know the answer, so I'll just close leaving that question for you. So Lee, you lived up to your reputation as Mr. Random. <laughs> uh, Mr. What? Mr. Random. Oh, yes. Mr. Random. Yes. Oh. But, but what I like is this. That's a, the nicest a, way of ever saying scatterbrain. No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that nice. A million ideas, but some real good ones in there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, right there. Uh, okay. So uh, I didn't know you speak last. Really, I could have been an answer. <laughs> anyone bold enough? Right. That's the question. <coughs> Ask a question about Henderson. This is important. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah, great. I have a question. I want to know. You're very bold. What, what's wrong with the simulation class? So, it usually seems to me like teaching the class that a lot of people want to take is fun. So, what's wrong it's with the simulation class? It's too big. You know, you, you want, I can, 35 students, I can learn all their names, 36, none of their names. There's just this capacity. And so it's, it's too large, for one thing. And then there's a lot of simulation languages. 
that out. So you say, I don't know what language you teach, but that's the first thing they ask you. They say, you teach the language, what language do you teach? And I teach all of them, because they're all alike. And so in the last few weeks, we learned three languages, not two, because with two, you can only see differences. You need three to see similarities. I told this to my daughter. She was dating this one guy's a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> and she did another guy and said, oh, they're so different. And I said, no, 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 you only know two. You should date a third person to see how similar those guys really were. <laughs> See, that worked. So they have, they have to learn sort of three languages, but by that time they know they're all the same except the interface. <laughs> um, and so that's another thing. There's a lot of software. To answer your question, there's a lot of software you have to keep current on. The nice thing is the marketplace makes them the same. Somebody has a good idea or steals it. And so you just do that part. Um, I don't know, you have eight TAs and 200 students, and it's a required course. I don't think any university has it as an elective, which is a shame because you've got that first two weeks of getting over the resentment <laughs> of a required course. So there's, I don't know. No, no, we're, gonna be, we're gonna be a little bit careful about class size because uh, the teachers are a humongous class. Ah! Yeah, that's not big, you know. <laughs> so there's like tiny, oh, that's all, yeah. But uh, maybe in the interest of time, we've got a panel. Right. Yep. So, so thanks very much, please. Yep.